Good evening. Good evening. Call, call to order the meeting of the Committee of Rules, Ordinances, and Orders for August 12th. I'm Councilor David Murphy, I chair. Councilor Maureen Carney and Councilor Jesse Adams are the other two members of the committee. Um, I'm going to announce that there is audio recording and minutes being taken, and I also see we're being videoed for an appearance on the North Street Neighborhood Association website if you want to catch the late night version of our read. <laughs> so, first order is to approve minutes of the June 10th and July 8th meetings. Okay. All right, now we'll call to order our public hearing. We have a couple of public hearings tonight. Um, the first public hearing is on three ordinances to amend Chapter 350A and B, the Table of Use Regulations under Zoning for URA, URB, and URC. And also, um, so that is 350A and B for the Table of Uses, and 356.8, uh, consistent with the sustainability requirements in the field. So, what I'm going to do first is have uh, Carolyn from the Office of Planning and Development highlight what we're going to be working on and then we'll take public comment after that.
combine the use and dimensional tables into one table for each district so that people can go to their zoning district and know most of what they need to know about what their neighbor what's allowed in their neighborhood how um, how the layouts are required to to be um, it also simplifies the zoning ordinance by allowing um, basically providing for one dimensional standard for any type of use currently there are various there's a whole range of um, lot size requirements setbacks heights um, for depending on what kind of use, if you're non-conforming use or a conforming use, if you're a single family or a three family, there are different dimensional standards. So this really simplifies it by creating one standard for no matter what kind of use um, there is in it you know, or um, density there. Um, <clears throat> as also uh, a key component is the addition of design standards. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, but to this point in the city's um, regulatory history as it relates to zoning, there's never the only place that we really look at design is for historic districts. So we have an Elmstreet Historic District Commission that reviews design, and we also have a Central Business Architecture Review Committee, which is sort of a, a, a little bit um, different type of design review. But we've never had design review for um, the neighborhoods in the city. So this introduces um, design and there was a lot of discussion um, through the course of the um, work on rezoning um, proposed rezoning changes um, and a lot of debate back and forth about how much design to incorporate and um, some people felt like we needed very detailed architectural standards but there was a large majority of people who were also concerned that we shouldn't go too far because then it sort of um, might inhibit um, um, people's creativity and creating spaces that work for them or creating new designs uh, to introduce uh, to a neighborhood. And then um, also the concern about adding too many architectural standards was that there aren't really any, unlike an Elm Street historic district where you've got um, a sort of defined geographic area uh, where you can find characteristics of certain homes within a small geographic area throughout these neighborhoods is there are very eclectic styles and on any given block there are, um, it would be hard to, to categorize a type of a particular type of architectural style so um, in the end um, the what's in front of you and what the plan were proposed was um, sort of the first foray into design standards that, that um, tries to address um, impacts of, of new development that might come forward in a neighborhood but not restrict architectural um, um, characteristics to the extent that it would um, restrict um, creativity and, and new design. Um, so there are a lot, there are many more sort of form-based design characteristics and site design issues that are addressed in the design standards. Um, there's also simplification for parking calculations and um, elimination of some uses. As we went through all the tables, there were some uses that really didn't make sense in the residential neighborhood. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the overview of what's in the package. Um, there have been some modifications since it was initially introduced to try to um, address further some concerns that have come out in public hearing. So the language has been clarified since um, to, to that point, and those, I don't, those um, clarifications are redlined in the um, text, and they've been redlined all along as you, as you uh, proceeded through this uh, public hearing process. And then the latest uh, proposed uh, modification is in front of you is from um, Councilor Adams that came up at the last that right before that hearing to further address um, design characteristics and standards for people who are building more than 10 units. So we, one of the um, changes that was uh, recommended through this uh, process to address concerns was creating a special permit standard for the construction of um, seven or more units at a time. And that has been further honed by adding additional standards for uh, projects.
projects that entail 10 or more units to really ensure that they're are, um, that the same standards are used across the board in subdivision re review as special permit and site plan and address um, pedestrian um, amenities construction materials for streets and sidewalks and curbing and um, water lines and things like that. Now, that last amendment is one of the reasons we're here again tonight because it's so substantially changed, it so st substantially changed the ordinance that it required us to have an additional public hearing, correct? Well, um, I guess it's, it wasn't exactly 100% clear, so the safe thing would be to have a public hearing. I think adding design standards, um, and modifying those don't necessarily trigger a permit. The special, the special permit standard certainly required an additional public hearing, which um, we had already. But it makes sense, um, particularly since city council, the full city council wanted to have um, you all discuss other issues, particularly the question about assessment in more detail, to go ahead and advertise all of that. So it was clear, you know, what was being discussed, and we weren't trying to push anything. I just wanted to let people know, you know, this is a lot of this is repeating the public hearing we had in June, but things have changed enough that we wanted to be sure that there was public input again on everything, including those changes. Okay. Anything else before we take comments? Um, yeah. Okay. And you'll be here to answer questions. Yes. And I don't know if you want, I mean, I can sit down or you take public comment or just, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you yeah, make yourself comfortable if somebody has a specific question that we need your expertise for. Yep. Yeah. Oh, sure, if you want to ask Carolyn a question. Yep. Uh, before we use that. I, uh, I want to thank Wayne for working on the, on the amendment. And the amendment, as Ms. Mish said, said was, um, was, was an attempt to addressing some of the concerns around um, certain projects that, that uh, may give some anxiety due to size to some neighborhoods. And so, um, I think that by requiring them to follow the subdivision requirements of Chapter 290, I hope that's an additional safeguard. Uh, but Ms. Mitchell and Ms. Biden, if you could explain specifically uh, what specific sections of the code they would have to follow, uh, just so that uh, just so that, that would help us identify and help articulate um, exactly what the safeguard would be. Sure. Um, so the way the, um, I'll just read the language that spells out in uh, more detail um, that's, that's proposed on the table. Any multifamily or townhouse project creating seven or more units requires special permit approval. And for any such project that creates 10 or more units, design standards for the length of dead end streets, the protection of natural features, sidewalks, wheelchair ramps, landscaping, utilities, construction methods and materials for water lines, sanitary sewers, storm sewers, fire protection, sidewalks, and private roads, and other infrastructure shall be those set forth in Chapter 290 of the Subdivision of Land. Uh, and this would apply for even for private roadways that are not intended to be um, public ways um, and driveways that are not part of the subdivision, unless the Planning Board finds that there's a different standard that's more appropriate. So what that means is um, that um, uh, in the subdivision rules, let's take the dead end streets issue um, initially, and in uh, the way it would affect, I guess, or um, relate to these urban core neighborhoods, we don't have a lot. Um, there are very few dead end streets. I mean, some of them, there are historical dead end streets that um, were terminated because either of wetlands or bumping into the railroad or things of that sort. But they're typically shorter stub streets that end because you've got some kind of land constraint. Subdivision rules um, restrict the length of dead end streets. Um, similarly, to encourage the, the, the purpose behind it is to encourage connectivity so that we don't have these long, winding streets that just end and that don't have any relationship to other portions of a neighborhood. So that um, standard would still apply, even though you might not be creating a subdivision. The idea is that when you're creating a new project, you want to integrate it into the neighborhood and make it feel as though it was always part of the neighborhood, so that you're not creating sort of this um, uh, 
sort of walled off community, if you will, or, or um, something that really sticks out, I guess, as, as inconsistent with the neighborhood. Um, also, we have other standards in the subdivision rules about um, identifying natural features that are important to protect. Um, this could be stream crossings or um, habitat. And we also have standards for um, construction of sidewalks so they can be concrete and granite curves so that, again, it, it's sort of more of an urban character and the way that many of the streets um, in the city are now and how we're building when it, DPW goes um, and constructs new streets. For instance, North Street now we're building um, to these standards as well with sidewalks and granite curves. The creation of that, and that, that, I guess, the pedestrian access and the standards are important because we're talking about neighborhoods that aren't accessible to um, core uh, commercial areas and, and mixed-use areas, so we want to make sure that we're continuing to make those connections and uh, encouraging walkability and access uh, through separated pedestrian. Including the more than one structure could be allowed on one parcel in this section of the, the scope. Yes, I'm sorry, I failed to make that's a part of the package as well. Um, and that has come up in quite a bit of discussion about uh, allowing flexibility for um, carriage houses that have historically been built, or maybe new carriage houses, as long as they fit in with um, fit the setbacks, that um, potentially could be converted to um, residential. So, public comment, if you could, because we're being videoed, uh, identify your name and address, and uh, ready for the first person who would like to speak. Please. I have more. Uh, Jump right up. <clears throat> come, come up to the podium, though, if you could, so we can get you Jack, on our recorder. Jack Barocas, 57 Lyman Road. Um, on the listserv we, that we have in our neighborhood, I, I received a message and it seemed to say that if this went through, uh, it seems that Smith is going to sell Wyman Estates. And if the developer moved in and put housing there, they could put in a lot more units if this went through, if, if it didn't. I, I just like clarification. I don't really understand it. <laughs> if anybody could clarify that, I would appreciate it. Sure. I, um Smith College has, um, as I think folks know, has been rethinking its campus and trying to consolidate towards its core. And for many years, um, we've known that there's, they've owned excess property that they're um, trying to divest themselves of. So one of those is the, the line of the state. Um, and, um, Currently, it, it is in the urban residential C district for the most part, I think entirely, in the urban residential C district um, and, and right at the edge of uh, downtown. So, um, you know, looking at that as part of the whole zoning package, yes, the zoning would allow more units than currently is allowed in the urban residential C district, but, but I'm not sure that there are you know, that's always been in the background that they've been wanting to sell that estate it was five years ago, ten years ago, or five years from now. So, um, I don't know that that piece has changed. I, I just, I'm just curious about that piece particularly. Um, I don't know what would be the difference in the number of units between the two, uh, the two proposals. What it is now in the proposals. Sure. Um, you know, it, it varies. Currently, as I mentioned previously, there are different standards. So there's a different height standard and a different density standard depending on the type of construction you're building. So if you want to build an apartment, a four-story apartment building, there's a di different density requirement today under today's standards. Um, and so overall, I think um, the idea is um, with this zoning is well, as I mentioned before, to create one standard so it's easier to understand sort of how many units. But I 
and, and at the same time, the zoning matches sort of what's been built out in the neighborhoods in terms of getting to those units. So the one thing that's difficult to understand about the Lyman Estate is, um, you know, it's up on a steep slope. So there's some of the land that probably isn't going to be developed anyway, so it would be hard to make a calculation about how many units. I saw something that was a big click on, mm -hmm. and the difference in the number of units was about 30 between one and the other. Yeah. And the types of units as well. And um, if you could clarify what a unit means, <laughs> is that a house, is that an apartment? It could be either. So a dwelling unit in right. any kind of configuration, you could do, you know, a series of single families or two families or three or four, or you could do, you know, five units in the building and have a cluster of right. units. And I do understand that it's Smith College property to sell, and I don't have, I can't have an objection to that, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and what's built there, uh, again, there's a whole bunch of ways I think it could be built that I would be perfectly happy with, and the whole bunch is going to not. And uh, I'm not sure how this affects that. Yeah. As far as um, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's true that the number of units um, in the proposal, you could probably do more units in the proposed zoning than um, what you could do under the current zoning. I think having, the one thing that we don't have today um, is our design standards, and we don't have um, site layout um, standards or control for, for, um, for things such as roadway networks. And I think that's a good parcel to think about in terms of where applying something like the same standards we have in the subdivision rules, because you don't necessarily, to build out that parcel, you don't necessarily need to go through the subdivision review process. You could go through what we call site plan approval. Right now, we don't have a special permit process for seven or more units, for example, for um, new construction in but, the URC district. But, but the proposal then creates a special <coughs> permit process for more than seven units, and then it also applies any number of units would have to um, meet the design standards for layout and fitting into the context of the neighborhood and um, you know, connectivity and street infrastructure or, or even driveway infrastructure for that matter. So that all is not present today in today's ordinance, but the proposal could potentially, I guess I would say, positively affect an outcome of the design for that person. That sounds good. How can I find out about what those proposals are for the design? Well, any type Smith College were to proceed, um, they would need to apply for a permit. We haven't heard anything from them, but and the neighbors would be notified because under state statute, you're required. We're required to notify everyone within 300 feet. It's a. It would be a massive project. I'm sure the entire city would know about it because the papers would do, you know, an article about. It. But we have not heard that they're proceeding in any way on that. And but it certainly would generate a public hearing. So this is just. Yeah. Um, um, Proposal by uh, some uh, people that they hire that said they should divest of some property. You know, this is the one that they invest on, but it seems like they that. Can I answer a slightly different way? I mean, I think there's no question they're going to divest it in some Sure. I'm not sure when that is, and they're probably going to keep their preschool there. But, um, if the issue is, we don't know what the market would want. You know, if they said they could do a single family homes, it would be easy to assess you know, what it, the zone would change. If they said they're doing multifamily, but we don't know, does this potentially change the kind of units they want? So that, you know, in making single family homes a lot smaller, for example, one approach is to allow it more density, but it also may actually make single family homes more desirable than apartments. Um, because right now you get you get more units on a piece of land than multifamily. And so that's that's one of the balancing acts. You know. State hospital is probably the best example. State hospital basically allows any kind of development up there, and yet you don't see all the big, big apartment buildings in the market. So right. Clearly, big apartment buildings is not uh, You know, I mean, if there were 50 single homes and an area that was clear and left open, I mean, I, I'm only speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for the rest of the neighborhood, I wouldn't have an objection. 
function. It wouldn't do enough places in and out so that the traffic wouldn't get crazy. Um, but I just don't know how this is going to affect the Thank you. Yeah. Another <coughs> person to comment? Mr. Kirby. Step right up. I had my engineers brought out a special plan here. I hope you all can see it because it's absolutely done. <laughs> Let's see. This is a, a rough projection of what would happen if the new zoning went through in terms of the area around Henry Street in Ward 3. What we have, what the ZRC said and what the, um, and what the public hearings brought out was the fact that they did not want to impact any one particular neighborhood. They, they don't want to see isolated severe impacts on the, on the quality of life in the neighborhoods, on the, on, the, on the existing neighborhoods. And what we have in this area is a dense, densely populated area running along William Street down into the, down into the meadows. And all the, pretty much all the area below, I think it's 120 feet, is mostly wetlands. And this particular here area on the Montfort Farm is, is designated, I think FFR, which I don't know what it stands for. What does it stand for? Farmers Forest. Farm what? Farmers Forest. Yeah. Essentially, my feeling is that this area, there's an active farm, there's an active two farms in this area, and there's a lot of wetlands, and all the area that goes in the shadow of the dike is predominantly agriculture. And what it means is, I think in the old days, they laid out tracks that, that ran for miles, almost, you know, like all the way from um, from Henry Street to the river, maybe maybe a hundred feet wide or eighty feet wide or something. These strips, and these days, and then Route 91 cut that through. That was the first cut, or actually the first cut was the dike. And so what we have are these stub lots down Henry Street. And in this area, I counted, I think, 12 of them, 12, 12, 12 narrow deep lots. And, and many of them have single family houses on them. Many of them have agricultural uh, buildings, some of which are falling down. But there is a kind of a continuity of use, let's say, not to get high pollution, that that runs in the shadow of the dike where you have an area that really should be have the same zoning as the on the other side special conservancy. I mean that should be zoned for predominantly agricultural single family. But what we have because we have all these thin lots that you can get these long, thin developments, like City View, or what's the name of it? City, city View. Yeah, That's City View Apartments. Essentially, and with the new parking, it means that you can have one parking space for every thousand square feet. Now, God gave Americans cars. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave them enough cars to get by them. And the average person, group, family group, that's living in a thousand square feet or twelve hundred square feet, has something like 2.2 .2 cars. 
So when you have these narrow lots with inadequate parking, you're going to have a lot of impact on the neighborhood. By classifying this as a walkable neighborhood, people aren't going to walk from these new developments. They're not going to walk from here. They're going to take their cars. Finally, that this true has been with us for some time is an issue. There have been public hearings. There have been the ZRC spent almost two years, I think, or maybe more than two years um, going over. But the rules, the fundamental rules were changed late in the game. Um, they were changed when staff suggested that we increase the density, make it possible to have smaller lots, and have the the, the parking thing. So essentially, there's no moral high ground here that you get by having something that the ZRC, which is made of citizens, made up of citizens, developed, and then now we're voting on. Essentially, we've got a hybrid thing that has kind of morphed. And right now, We've had a whole new, I guess tonight we've learned that there are new changes. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, other comments? <clears throat> oh, please. <clears throat> Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. Um, I'm not an expert on any of this, but is it true to say that when the new zoning passes, that there will be, it, the, the point is to make it more dense in the downtown neighborhood, to put infill in, and so the result will be more density in the, those areas that are designated. So with this man's question about what does it mean for him, I mean the point of the zoning and the point right of the planning now is infill, and infill means to put development in the inner zone. And so it's going to be more dense because that's what we're trying to do with the infill. Is this true? Or am I overstating this? <laughs> um, well, as, as um, I mentioned, there are the three districts in which the zoning is proposed to be changed. And it would, the zoning more um, closely matches the way the neighborhoods have been built out. So there are many lots um, that are that would now conform, that don't conform to the current zoning. And what, by changing the zoning to match what was built out, would allow some parcels that um, had not been able to be built upon since 1975 when the um, zoning, the new zoning at that time came into effect and prohibited any more um, development, would allow new units to be built or for people who have larger lots and have an existing home to add an apartment. So from that perspective, yes, it would allow some more units in a way, in a place, in places that are accessible by bike, by walking, um, and by other means of getting to goods and services so that we can reduce the pressures uh, for uh, for the demand for new housing and other locations. But, but the point of infill is because we're going to expand, we're going to have, we hope to have, or whatever, growth, and the point is, so we're planning for that. We're going to even encourage it by making it easier for people to put, play, put more units either on Henry Street or in Lyman Road or whatever. It's going to be easier to put more. Whatever it looks like, it, could, it won't be any high rises and it will be maybe small single houses, but the point of all of this is about putting more development in the core of the city, so we're going to have more density. It's just as a thought. I'm just saying, asking if, if that is actually the case, and I'm not overstating it. Or I think that's mostly true. I think the, the distinction that's important is this is an area we're talking about. We have for 30 years, the population's been dropping. We have the same number of units, more or less, but the population's dropping just because all families here are so allowing more units isn't the same thing as allowing more people. I think if we came back 10 years from now, I suspect we'd still find fewer Right, people. right. Well, I, I agree that there probably, maybe there won't be more people, but 
just in, you know, I spoke at the city council meeting, and I think I was at the meeting in June, but just to talk about uh, the issues that come up for us in our neighborhood, because I live on Valley Street, and it's just one street up from what Mike was talking about on Henry Street. So, you know, when you're talking, I mean, our area is already very dense. We have very narrow roads, and it's a sort of a f edge of the farming community, and so having uh, development in there, we already have development like these city uh, apartments, city view apartments and so forth, brings a lot more traffic into the neighborhood and the very narrow streets and so it puts a strain on on the streets, it puts us, we don't have good crosswalks, we don't have good sidewalks, we don't have the infrastructure to actually support more infill in our neighborhood. And so when you talk about matching the design of the neighborhood with concrete sidewalks and, you know, curbstone, well, we have tar. You know, we have tar sidewalks and no curbstones and big potholes. And mostly we don't have any sidewalks. And we just, you know, so it's not got the infrastructure. So, I mean, I see what's happening on North Street, and it's totally amazing. Those curbstones and the sidewalks, like, if I could get them in my neighborhood without the new zoning, I would really welcome them, because I want that for my neighborhood. But what I don't want is, the, is, is that I don't think that these regulations have taken in this human aspect of it, that, that, that there are people in these neighborhoods that that are like, as I stated at the city council meeting, that are really struggling to, to exist in what is a very uh, eclectic urban neighborhood with the fairground and the airport and the sewage plant, all there. Well, they're all there with us in our neighborhood. And now we're going to maybe have more cars and more dense development stuff. So, so there's just something about this. And actually, and I have just one more question, and then I'll stop, because without the clock, as you know, I could go on and on. So, <laughs> so fine. Um, Mike, Mike, if you like, I'll do my best. <laughs> just <laughs> banging your fist, and we can start screaming at each other. But um, now I forgot what my, my last question was going to be. Is, is it? I, I guess I don't understand what's going to happen as a result of this meeting. Are you going to like listen to us now and then send a recommendation on these amendments back to the city council and then they'll vote? Or is there a possibility that this will get sent back to planning in a new committee? That isn't a possibility. Uh, my, uh, what I'm thinking is going to happen is that the new uh, Councilor Adams recommendation, which is one of the main reasons we're here tonight, to restrict larger developments uh, and put more regulation on them will probably be incorporated into this and it will wind up back at the city council again. I don't think it's headed back to planning. I think it's headed back to the council again. That would be my my guess at this point. Will you vote? Will, do you have the power to decide what, whether you will actually redo it or not? Or that's a city council decision? More the city council's decision. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, please come on up. Someone who's actually been dealing with this longer than we have. <laughs> yeah, except these guys have been working harder. So, um, anyway, uh, my name is Jim Nash of 18 Montview. I was a member of the, the ZRC. Um, that um, that a part of why we're struggling with these new dimensional standards has to do with the work that we came up with. And one of the reasons I keep coming back and harping on things around design standards was that we worked by consensus. All of us agreed, all of us unanimously agreed on a package of ideas to go forward. And um, one of those ideas was decreasing the dimensional standards. But also within that was this idea that we would have design standards for how this infill was going to happen. Uh, that um, uh, thus far, uh, planning department, uh, we, we have design standards that have to do with the streetscape, which I'm, I'm largely fine with. I think that uh, that it's it's simple. Uh, I, I agree with what Carolyn said that uh, people were were not interested in uh, having restrictions on uh, architectural restrictions, but they did want that block face of what it would look like from the street. The part that's missing from it is that um, many of the lots that we have in Northampton are actually much deeper. 
we're talking about de decreasing that, that, that frontage requirement, it, but we're not taking into, the account, into account that many of the lots in Northampton, and part of the reason it makes it so pleasant to live here is we have these dense streets, but once you get behind the streets, a lot of people have some really nice backyards. And what by, um, by having a unit per acre without some sort of development idea to say, well, if you're going to go back into somebody's backyard, it needs to look like this. It needs to present to neighbors in a certain way. It, your, your lot needs to be a certain width. It can't be just 50 feet wide because you're going to have a building looking right into somebody else's backyard. And that my hope was that those types of design standards would be part of this package. And that's why I agree to consensus to uh, lessening the, design, uh, the dimensional standards. Um, I just want to say that, you know, backyards are an intrinsic part of what people think about when they think about the design of our neighborhoods in Northampton. And that by allowing this uh, development that puts a value, a unit per unit value on the backyard, it, it, it's actually, uh, it, it can increase property values. Um, two things I'd like to add. Um, the ZRC um, came up with a, um, uh, a way to um, I'm doing this with notes. <laughs> they came up with a way to, um, to fill the gap between where we are now and where we want to be. And the idea was to create a three-year special infill permit that had allowed a lot of latitude to the, planning uh, to the planning board and the planning department so that they could hear stuff and we could really process stuff and start to go, oh, yeah, right, we didn't think of that. You know, oh, this is a particular situation so we could create the zoning as we went along. And then at the end of the three-year period, then we could lock something in and say, this is how our infill is going to look. Um, I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. Because I, I, I'd like to say that um, uh, Councillor Adams, his amendment for the, um, the 10 or more, I am supportive of that idea. I think that's, that we're working in the right direction. I worry about the gap between four units, three, two to four units for all of the URs, and what we get to a 10. Because we haven't figured that's, and the problem is that's most people's backyards. You know, uh, Councillor Adams' uh, proposal would have to do with properties of three quarters of an acre or larger. Anything smaller than that, we'd be taught, we'd be subject to these. What we don't know. Uh, the last thing is that um, that a um, member of the Ward Three Neighborhood Association has done some um, number crunching using the assessors list, and that. Um, that based on the, and these, these are ballpark numbers, these, um, that um, for URA, uh, this could potentially mean as many as 1,000 uh, more units in, in URA. It could mean uh, 3,258 in URB, and it could mean um, uh, where's the URB? Uh, 1,524 for URC. Now, we know that this is the ballpark way off in the distance if we filled everything out. But the thing is, are people going to be assessed on that maximum fill, you know, based on how many units per acre they could get on their properties? And that, so I just throw that out there because this isn't just a Ward 3, URC, Montview, Henry Street issue. This is, this is throughout the city, and um, so. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Carolyn, do you have any uh, comment at this point? Yeah, I just I think it would be valuable probably to go through the detailed design standards so that everyone understands because uh, what um, Jim was referring to actually was addressed as one of the amendments as we went through. Um, so um, I will read through um, the design standards, um, which are would be applicable to all units that uh, all structures that trigger site plan review, which is anything other than a single family home, is 
more than 2,000 square feet. So this would apply for to that one to seven units before a special permit is triggered. All of these design standards apply. Um, the first is that um, you know if a garage or other um, parking structure is attached, um, it must be set back 20 feet, um, uh, which is the um, this is I'm reading through Urban Residential C, but all the design standards apply. Um, except in URA, the setbacks are 20 feet anyway, whereas in the BNC districts, the setbacks um, are 10 feet from the front. Um, and that the structure shall, shouldn't compromise more than 30% of the front facade. And the idea behind that is to really ensure that new structures are um, consistent with the way um, structures were built before we had cars that um, all over the place that need a parking structure. So garages tend to be at the back of the properties, very close to the lot line. The second standard is the front doors must face the street um, uh, on new structures. Um, and um, for units that extend beyond the front units, this is an addition that was added after the public hearing process that addresses exactly what um, Jim was referring to. Um, where or where entries in other cases where there are units behind that front unit where the entries orient to the side, which would then be a neighbor's, potentially in a butter's backyard, um, a 20-foot side setback instead of the standard 10 or 15 feet would be required, um, which again sort of creates more space between um, yards that wouldn't normally be there for a single family home where you have a 10 or 15 foot side setback. And that would apply unless um, there are other means to create buffering to an adjoining property. So if a fence or significant landscaping were created to again maintain privacy between backyards. So that standard applies. Um, and uh, buildings um, shall have a, a covered front entry. Um, the third standard is for new buildings, setback scale and massing should fit into the block face. Um, and uh, parking, and then four, parking for more than five cars shall be distributed on the site to minimize the impact on the neighborhood character. This can be accomplished by creating small groupings of parking spaces um, surrounded by landscaping or creating a parallel parking uh, along and sort of more of an alley kind of configuration um, along a narrow driveway. And that if there are driveways that are wider than 15 feet, they should be visually buffered from the abutter's property, um, again, to sort of address um, uh, potentially um, variation in, in um, you know, parking that aren't there, weren't there before uh, a structure was built. Um, and this can be accomplished through greater setbacks for driveways to, par to property lines or through screening. So some, there's been some mention of City View um, townhouse project, which is um, didn't have the benefit of any design standards of this sort. And you've got a big parking pad, sort of massive um, parking in front of units, which is not um, typical or characteristic of any of the neighborhoods, A, B, or C. Um, so this really addresses that kind of um, standard or concern. And then, um, and, th and that's sort of the, the final one to really address these site um, standards and impacts to backyards. Um, the other thing I just thought I would mention is um, the number and the scale of potential units I think would really only be if someone came in and tore down units or if there were, you know, a tragic storm and eliminated all the units in the neighborhood, then to build back you might get to those numbers. But from looking at the, the way, the incremental way that development has happened in Northampton and little um, potential little pockets here and there of units, um, staff calculation was uh, significantly less. It would be somewhere between 1 and 5% um, new units in each of those districts. Um, additional comment? Jim, you want to just follow up? And then we'll I, I just want to say, in terms of potential development, when we bring um, into compliance, you know, 60%, 70% of the properties, and we're opening them up to more units, that 
that's a big number, and that's that's how those numbers came from. And I, I would I would argue it's it's you know much more than one to five percent. I'm my numbers are probably high, but we it, it's going to be bigger than that. So. All right, please. <clears throat> Hi, Mac Everett. Uh, I'm married to this one, <laughs> and Jim is my neighbor, so we've been we're kind of on the same page about this. But I want to, and I, I don't want to go through everything that they've already stated, but but mention a few points that um, are on my mind too. I spoke to the council, and and uh, I'll try not to repeat myself too much. But I think basically what it boils down for me is um, is modest modest infill versus some kind of radical infill. And um, I and I think most of my neighbors really don't have a problem uh, with people adding an apartment or if they have an oversized lot, putting a small house on it or changing it to family for, to a one, vice versa. Um, it's really the, the kind of large scale townhouse developments set in the urban, back in the neighborhoods that is really uh, a concern. Um, I think those kinds of developments belong more on parts of King Street or Pleasant Street or other large downtown arteries where they can fit in and be a part of uh, the downtown landscape in a, in a more appropriate way. Um, I just am concerned that the large scale stuff and, and particularly this the Henry Street area would really change the feeling of the neighborhood that I live in and would really uh, tax the infrastructure severely. Uh, as Claudia mentioned, we live on the on Montview. It has one sidewalk on for the two sides of the street. Henry Street is the same way. Um, and the potholes and so forth. So we're, our infrastructure is, is, is really, it feels kind of like um, more 19th century than 21st century at this point, and, uh, and that's a major concern. Um, I, I also wanted to I wanted to ask Carolyn a question. When I looked over the the, the packet that I had, um, it appears that um, multifamily and townhouse development would be permitted in URB and URC, but not in URA. Is that correct, or, or am I misreading that? Right. Currently, urban residential A allows single families and single families with an accessory apartment. So the, the um, proposal is an urban residential A that would stay the same except the lot size would um, change to allow more of those types of units. Yeah, I mean it seems unfair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that um, urban, that URB and URC would be in a position to have a significant increase in that type of development and, and URA would be exempt. I don't I don't understand what the thinking behind that. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say URA is exempt. I think that what um, there are, as we've been looking at ways to implement the Sustainable Northampton, there um, are many items on the task list to address. And one of the things that um, so we're doing is piecemeal because we're doing it in house, and we're trying to take. You know, we started with uh, the business districts, now and we've done some residential, and now this is. The residential piece. Um, part of that is actually looking at um, urban residential at A as a whole and um, a as, a, as a separate piece, I should say, um, because it is sort of an anomaly. I mean, you look at that and look at where URA is, it doesn't necessarily tell the same history of the other two districts, whereas for example, in urban residential C, it's sort of that first ring around the entire downtown, not just on one side in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. but it actually goes around up um, into Ward 2 and Ward 4, um, up Elm Street, and it really is sort of that core residential area around the entire downtown. Urban residential B, that is sort of that point mm -hmm. between um, C and Florence Center, and then wraps around Florence Center. And it's really those are the neighborhoods that have been focused around those um, core. Urban A is not so clearly defined. And so one of the issues is um, we need to take a harder look at 
what is A, what does it want to be, where, where does it make sense? So one of the next things on the, tab, on the list is to say, you know, there are some places in urban residential A that don't make sense to be more densely developed because they're out on Ryan Road and they're not walkable or bikeable to um, goods and services. So instead of just throwing all of A in and saying we're going to change X, Y, and Z about it, I think that is the other the issue really is make, looking at A and saying, well, parts of A go to suburban <coughs> residential, the parts of A go to B or something like that. So that's sort of the next step or one of the next steps that we need to look at in terms of um, implementation of the plan. Can you describe where A is? What are the sections of the city that are you are A? Mm -hmm. Sorry, but and B and C. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean we've done that at various public hearings, and I certainly do that at council again. Um, as I mentioned, C is sort of um, starting downtown. Um, C immediately abuts the central business district. So the central business district is Main Street, parts of State Street, King Street, and Pleasant Street going south. So State but Street off oh, to the other end. State Street is the end of the C on that side? No. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Urban residents, yeah. So uh, central business is sort of a blob in the middle that encompasses Main Street, King Street, Pleasant, and parts of State, parts of South, parts of Con Street. Um, and around that, um, so in one or one and two going out up to um, past Finn Street, Aldrich Street, up into Round Hill is Urban Residential C, up Elm Street, Henshaw, those streets are C, going out West Street, there's some C out there, and then coming back around off of Lyman um, is C, and then looping back around Fruit Street, um, and then south, all of those neighborhoods, right, right Avenue, down Cons and Pleasant, and then up around Henry Street, um, and then sort of um, going up to Pomeroy Terrace, um, and actually I have a, uh, essentially we looked at where it is, it's really within uh, the entire urban residential C district, is within half a mile of uh, walking distance of um, downtown. Um, urban residential B, about C and moves up Elm Street all the way to Florence and circles Florence Center, and then it goes out. There's um, B in um, around Leeds, sort of that um, neighborhood of business area in Leeds around Main Street and Water Street. Um, and um, is Smith in B? Smith College is that in B or in C? C? B and C. There are also some pockets of A. With, um, so. There's parts of Ward Avenue and Vernon or Forbes that end by the river that's in A. There's a little tiny pocket on Langworthy that's urban residential A, but it's surrounded by C and B. So there are these little, block, literally blocks, one or two blocks of A between, you know, surrounded by B and C. And then there's urban residential A in Leeds. Um, and then there's some urban residential A out Ryan Road and some urban residential A north of Florence Center. Again, sort of four or five blocks. Yes, there's urban residential A on North King Street, and then it becomes rural residential or suburban residential, right? And um, I don't have the projector today, but I did. I showed that at the last public hearing, the maps, and I'll be sure to show that at the council meeting too, just to confirm and you've got the maps there. Yeah, I see got the maps. there. Mm -hmm. It's um, that with the A, B, and C. Right. Yeah, I mean, and actually one of the things I know, it's it's interesting to see the little islands of, uh, uh, of one uh, letter sometimes within a C of the other letter. And, and one, one that struck me as uh, comparable to the Henry Street situation is, is the um, the properties that go down to the Mill River up past Smith there are, well, they're in a, I think it's B, but they are, they're a little island of A. Do you know the ones right. I mean that, that extend down to the river there? And uh, they, they're very similar in dimension-wise, I think, to the, to, the, uh, to the Henry Street properties. The, the real difference there is topography. Because they, <laughs> they drop very yeah. steeply to the river. So they couldn't you know, possibly be. We've got a nice 
yeah. flat back of Henry Street to the right. side. They go right. Down. Right. And the bottoms of them, I'm sure, are in a flood zone. Cause they're they're, right down they're down actually there. in down. They're in the special conservancy zone in the back. When they when they back down there. Right. So anyway, I, I, I know there's other people who want to speak. I could go on, but I'm going to stop, so give other people a chance. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, more comments? Anyone else? Okay. Have any, anybody else with the first comment, and then we'll... Okay. I have, a, I have a quick comment. First of all, I have to thank you for clarifying this, because now I have a better understanding. But I just did a quick calculation in my head about the number of units on Fruit Street and Lyman Road and the uh, area in between. And if you could put 128 units there, you would have two to three times the number of units that they have on the streets on either side. I went to go shopping, stop and shop today. I come out Wyoming Road. I had to pull over to allow another car to go by. If you triple that amount, what I really want to ask is, so what happens if someone says, well, we're going to put 128 units, and there's going to be one, one road down to Fruit, one to Lyman. Do we have something to say about that? How does that work? Anybody? <laughs> uh, well, any project is required to do, and in a project at that scale, would the proponent would be required to look at traffic impacts, look at access, egress, um, and address any impacts that are created. Okay, so we would have a chance to come back up and say, you probably uh, you know, be able to 80 is fine, 128 is right. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 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 That would be a defining work for quite a while. Okay. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. I'm Owen Freeman Daniels, and this is my horrible mustache. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, a lot of people who have spoken are, are my constituents, and uh, but they're also they also have really valid concerns, and um, so I'm not just here out of duty to my to my residents. Um, in fact, sometimes I disagree with them and do so publicly. Um, in this circumstance, though, I I, I share a lot of their concerns, and I really want to um, I, I don't want to make this. Uh, I don't want to make this too combative because I really appreciate the, the Office of Planning and Development working with me. Uh, and I understand Councillor Adams regarding trying to um, amend this package uh, into something that's, um, that, is, uh, that does have some safeguards regarding uh, some of these larger developments. And um, I also concur that, uh, that uh, changing the um, Changing a lot of the units that you can put onto U, R, B, and C, but not A, is unfair, given the given what we've been talking about, especially with assessment, uh, with assessments possibly changing. Um, but uh, I do have the um, I have heard from the Office of Planning and Development that they uh, are going to be looking at U, R, A, uh, and uh, and looking at um, ways to um, to also allow um, the same benefits that accrue to U, R, B, and C, uh, those being, um, the main, for instance, uh, the, uh, the ability to reinvest in a property that has fallen into disrepair because you can do, put more units into it um, for U, R, A as well. Uh, in other words, um, to be able to add units there too. But uh, this just wasn't part of the package. And um, we actually debated this uh, in Edlu, and uh, the pack that amendment failed, so um, that might be forthcoming. But uh, as it stands now, it, I agree it isn't entirely fair. Uh, what I'm worried about regarding Councillor Adams's um, amendment is it's it seems unclear, um, for, for like. Chapter 290, I, I tried reading it, uh, and it's actually, it's readable, but it's long. It's very long. Uh, it has two types of subdivisions, um, and it has different sections for dead-end streets, protection of natural features. It's got multiple paragraphs for um, lizards, which um, 
which is good. But, uh, but I'm just saying, it's got a lot of paragraphs about lizards. And I want to know whether those lizards are going to be protected. And so, so I guess what I'm, what I'm looking for partially, and I didn't, just didn't hear it when Ms. Mish uh, answered Councillor Adams' question, is what specific parts of the code, like what sections? So I, I'm looking at 290-29 for dead-end streets. Is that the section that a developer would have to look at for, for, large, for a project that's greater than 10, 10 or greater units? Um, and then 290.33 is for natural features, 290.35 is for sidewalks, 290.36 is wheelchair ramps, and so on. And what I think is happening here is that this is a kind of a, a really good amendment because it almost gets at what uh, Mr. Nash was talking about regarding uh, a kind of, um, a kind of uh, in town in, in sort of an in-town in town standards. Uh, because clearly what's going on in this, in this amendment is that we want to use portions of Chapter 290. Which portions, I'm not exactly clear, but we want to use some portions, but not all of them, because that would make it into a suburban subdivision. We want an urban subdivision. Um, and so after a lot of, uh, of sort of thinking, and I've shared this, some of this with Councilor Murphy and, and, I th and no one else really. Uh, I don't think that we're ready for this, um, for, for actually for seven or more units. And I think it might be valuable for um, the Ordinance Committee and the Council to eliminate that bullet point under special permit for URC. It's basically to eliminate any multifamily or townhouse project creating seven or more units, just to delete it with the understanding that something like this, something like this, um, this uh, chapter 90 subdivision, a little bit more clearly, clear and a little bit more spelled out, would come forward to the council for the creation of these larger projects. So that rather than require additional standards for seven or more, we just prohibit seven. It, yes, but you know we know that we know that there's a there's a there's a desire down the road. There's yes, and, and I don't think I don't think we have to go far down the road, but I think that we can take a few months to get some clarity around these subdivision standards, and I think we can and I think we can get agreement even from many of my constituents, in fact, about almost everything else if we eliminate this one piece. And they have to know, and we have to, we have to agree that we, want, we, we don't want to preclude larger developments if done right. And I think that we almost have that here, but I just don't see it here, because it's just not clear enough for me. Um, and I don't understand also the final sentence about how the planning board might find a different standard being more appropriate. Well, how would they find that? What would be the different standard? I just think we need a little more from the planning board about that kind of standard. And uh, until then, I think we should eliminate that portion of, of URB and C. Thank you. Carolyn, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, the, the proposal actually is to eliminate the section 10 units or more that this new standard would apply. Which is where the planning board standard would come in. Right. But site plan was, what special permit was required for seven. Right. And then if you're within special permit, but you're doing seven units, this new standard wouldn't apply. If you're in special permit and you're doing 10 units, then okay. you have to comply with the standards in 290. One of the reasons it's not spelled out is because we don't want to spell out the same thing in two different um, okay. sections code and chapter 290 talks about the length of cul-de-sacs can't be more than 500 feet it talks about how you build a, such a cul-de-sac if you were less than 500 feet um, so there you know it tells you how to build a sidewalk tells you how to build um, you know what those dimensions are and as in the subdivision rules the planning board has the ability to waive any of the rules in the subdivision um, chapter under zoning the planning board is not allowed to waive anything unless it's specifically stated as such. And so 
we can't presume what some person who's very creative about integrating units into a development might come up with. Maybe the street is um, narrower, maybe a sidewalk is wider in one place and narrower in another because of um, a lizard or whatever other reason there might be to change a rule to allow more flexibility. And if it's allowed that the planning board can accept that as an argument, then it's a case-by-case -case basis, just like special permit is case-by-case. Case. Instead of spelling out exactly what those cases might be, because it would be um, impossible to know, that's what that standard is for. Okay, so for 789, under the current proposal, you buy special permit from the planning board, and 10 or more, you get the lizard law. Okay. As it now says. As it now says, okay. Um, any more public comment on this initial group? I know I've already spoken, but and now almost all the line and road people have left. But zoning is a really boring topic, and I think for most people, the idea of talking about this just is so overwhelming, and it just floats around, and we don't pay attention. And when we try to pay attention, it's really hard to get a grip on it. But I think what's clear to me is what's going to go behind Lyman Road, perhaps, is not what they're going to put in on Henry Street. And so you know, you've got this neighborhood, like Fruit Street up to Lyman Road there, and, and it's going to have the nice curves, and it already has the nice curves and stuff, and it's going to have maybe tasteful you know, single-family homes or whatever. I guess one of the questions is, when we're talking about development, and this came up in a conversation we had yesterday with some friends, what is the city looking for? Are we looking for affordable housing? And is that going to go up behind Lyman Road? Or are, are, are we looking to attract, what, it, what, who do we expect to live here? I mean, I heard at the city council meeting people talking about they want their kid to be able to grow up and afford a house here. And so I'm kind of making a plea for solidarity and really thinking about how this is going to affect everybody in the whole city. Um, and, and I'm worried that nobody can do that because zoning is too difficult, except for Jim Nash, who is our hero because he sticks with it all these years. But so whatever, I just really feel like, on some level, I wish that this would not be decided on very quickly, because I don't think the implications of this have percolated around. And I think that's maybe why these people come from Lyman Road, because all of a sudden, there's this idea, oh, something is happening that's going to affect us. So I guess I'm going to support Owen, say, go a bit slow with this. You know, It's very worrisome to people. And there's not, it's not hopeless. I mean, they reached consensus with this other committee, which is a miracle. So I'm just, that's my final thing. All right. Well, just, uh, oh, Mr. Hines. Would you just I'm not, I'm not recommending this, the, the seven units, the 10 units. But if you just say those units aren't allowed, I think it puts pressure on everyone to say, OK, our zone suddenly got much stricter, because right now multifamily is allowed in this district. Um, but it may be a realistic approach if you want to go there is to say, um, any town has project creating, whether it's seven units or 10 units is up to you, um, won't be allowed for six months. And then it puts pressure on, frankly, both council and planning board to say, we really want to focus on this. It lets us move forward in this. It knows that we have a real time clock that's ticking. Um, but it also just timetable-wise, what is most likely to occur, um, and, and when you mention time, this permits more time because with this public hearing, this issue has a, another life, another 90-day life. It gets into the fall when people come back from vacation. Mm -hmm. So what's most likely to happen is we'll send this back to the full council where it will be completely debated, and frankly, that's kind of where the political process takes place and where neighborhoods make deals with other neighborhoods to tweak it a little <laughs> bit. So. Um, nothing that happens here tonight is going to be final. It's going to end up back at the full council where there will be complete debate on it. Um, so that, again, it's, it's not going to live or die tonight. It's going to go back, back to the full council, I'm sure. Are there any more comments on A, B, C, or more than one structure on one lot? All right. Hearing none, we will move forward. Oh, Carolyn, were you? Yeah, I, I don't know if, I mean, I'll leave it to you all, but I know one of the reasons the council didn't want to take any action the last time was this concern about assessments and what the zoning would do to people's property values. So 
I don't know if you want to talk about that a bit more or just have that go back to council. Um, so I'd be happy to sort of say a few words about that. Um, okay. No one actually brought it up. I, I, I realize that, but I'm afraid that it will come back and then council will say, well, why didn't you talk about that? Go ahead. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, the issue about the concern about property values going up um, is, um, uh, was raised and, and I, I guess I want to clarify that, that zoning doesn't all of a sudden dictate how properties are assessed. They're still going to be assessed the same way they've always been assessed and that is meaning that properties are valued based on comparables. So if, you, you know, you have a single family house that um, potentially you could build an accessory apartment in which is every single family house in the city right now, the assessors don't assess that as a projected potential. Um, people who have single family homes and don't opt to build an accessory apartment aren't, aren't assessed as a two family. And so the same would apply for um, the ability to add two or, you, two or more units to a house. It's not going to suddenly change unless you take a proactive measure to to build a new unit or to subdivide your lot. Um, so, you know, if you had, if there's a house that sells um, down the road that is the same size and it happens, the value happens to go up, then obviously the assessors are going to take that into consideration and they will come back around the next year and do an assessment. So, I don't know if there are any other specific questions about it. You know a lot about assessment as well. So, well, my, um, my, my only concern when I brought up the council is is this scenario. I, no one's going to go looking at your lot if you've got a big lot on Henry Street saying with permits you could add five more units. I mean it would never go to that level because you'd have to be proactive and go get those permits. So that's not going to happen. But the, the scenario that does concern me is that you've got a hundred foot lot and your house is on the left side of that lot. And to the right of your house is a clear 60 feet of yard where your kids play ball. And it's clear to anybody that when we change the zoning and you only need a 50-foot lot, you have a clean, easy, kaplunk building lot right there. Um, that's really the only scenario where I would see that popping up. And where it happens is, you, you know, the assessors say, you've got your primary site, which is the amount of land you need for your house to be on. And um, there's a category for excess or additional land, undevelopable land. So let's say of, of your lot now, you have... Um, a primary site and so much extra undevelopable land, which they value at a lower rate. Well, let's say it's only undevelopable because you do not have adequate frontage and area for it to be subdividable into two lots. But with the zoning change, that undevelopable land now becomes what's called a secondary site. You've got your primary site, but you have enough extra land that you're not encroaching on with your house for it to be a secondary site. That is more valuable in the assessor world than additional undevelopable land. Now, to what extent that gets discovered, you know, heaven knows. One of the problems is the Department of Revenue, who supervises the assessors every now and then, gets hung up on land values and goes around and says, how many of these things you've got and can you tax them? So, if, if, you know, planning obviously isn't going to go looking for you, and the assessors may not want to go looking for you, but at some point, the Department of Revenue might say, hey, you know, how many of these you got out there? Um, and people are often surprised. I think that recently, a scenario, a scenario that just played itself out was one up on Lyme and Road, where an individual had a lot and built the house on that secondary lot. Um, and when they did that subdivision, were surprised that they got built for another entire building lot before they put the house on it. Um, I, I don't see the assessors or the planning department aggressively going and looking for these things, but ultimately they're going to pop up here and there, and it is it has the potential to change value. Not a, you know not I, I, I kind of disagree with Jim that they're not going to go run run around and find uh, a thousand more of these things, but it is a potential unintended consequence, um, and really only to the person who doesn't choose to develop it. Some people are going to be delighted to say, oh my goodness. My real estate just increased in value tremendously, and they're not going to mind it because now they've got something that's more valuable, and at some point they may choose to take advantage of that. So it's not just, that, you know, yeah, maybe you don't want to pay more taxes, 
but your bottom line just went up on your real estate investment because this is now more valuable because of zoning change. Right. So it's not altogether bad, but it could be conceived that way by somebody that said, well, gee, you know, I don't want to develop that in my lifetime. Right. You know, some of these kids may be real happy down the road, but today you might end up paying a few more dollars in taxes because it clicks so um, something to think about, but I don't see it being um, a, a, an issue to the tune of a thousand more units in the, you know, lots of them. Yeah. You just described our situation perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. So it may at some time get discovered and pop up, but at the same time, your property value increases at the point of time you choose to draw a plan. And I don't right. see, you know, if you go in for a, you know, subdivision approval not required because you statutorily meet that second building lot and it will get signed, at which point you should expect the assessors to raise your land value. Right. At that, That's typically where it happens now, right? Somebody yeah. comes in and says, by right I've got another lot, and planning checks it out and says, yes, you do, and the planning board approves it, and then shazam, right. the assessors discover it. But I think that's that situation. I think you could divide a lot right now. So it's not Maybe like, two lots. Right. So yours isn't real for zoning change. Yours is you could do it today. Yeah. It doesn't show up because they haven't done it. Right. It, doesn't, it hasn't shown up yet, right. but you could do it. Right. But the minute you, you know, confirm that with uh, getting a plan approved, then it's going to happen for sure. And that's the Lyman or the Ronda Road example I gave was the same thing. They came in with a plan and said, "Look, right. looky here, I got another building lot." And the assessor said, "You bet. Here's your, here's your second <laughs> <Here's your bill. laughs> But, but that could happen more and more. But again, the flip side of the positive is you've got a more valuable piece of property as a result, whether you choose to use it or not. Right. Yeah, Mr. Nash. David, I, the, I, I agree with you in the general idea that my numbers are high. And in fact, I'll, I'll share them with you later. It's just Marcy, the woman who put them together, she's away on the Cape camping. So I can't really talk with her to really verify it's, it's a here on disclosed location. <laughs> yes, but um, that I think there's a distinction between building lots mm -hmm. and what and people are allowed to add in terms of units. Yeah. And you know, in terms of building lots, I think people are mostly comfortable with, yeah, you know what, you got me there. You know, I, I got a building lot. It's it's the potential to develop to build multiple add multiple units onto an existing site that that's you know where. You know, seven, ten, twelve. That's start. That's what gets people. Yeah. Yeah. But on the, the assessment side of things, I don't. Before you can actually put those in the bank, you got to go to the planning board. You, you know, you've got a lot of work to do. It's more the by right stuff that I'm worried about. You know, that people are going to get caught on and not expect it. Certainly, if you go in and get a subdivision plan approved for your property, you, you're you're not going to be surprised at that point if the value of that property goes up as a result. The thing that I was concerned with was more the unintended consequence where that might happen uh, to people who didn't who didn't see it coming. But clearly if you've spent the money to do the engineering, you're probably not going to be surprised when that value gets recognized. And we do have a neighbor on Henry Street who's determined to do that to de develop something as soon as the, the zoning changes. So all of these properties on Henry Street, my property, we're It'll be the per unit type of assessment that will go on. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, any other questions on these first four or hearing last call here? All right. Uh, then, Carolyn, you want to move on to um, central business and the dimensional regulation changes for there? Uh, sure. So. The um, proposal for central business is um, actually um, a, an issue that has been discussed on and off for a little bit. But then we had this um, charrette, development charrette earlier, um, or late spring, I guess, with various um, housing interests and developers in um, town and floated the idea of allowing, right now we don't allow ground floor residential at all in the central business district. Um, and so we discussed in that um, arena uh, whether people felt like that was an impediment to development or if it was beneficial. And, for, and I think to a T, everyone felt like that was very important not to have residential presence along Main Street. 
Um, but that it might make sense to allow some flexibility for residential units back off the main street. Let's say you have a deeper lot and you can build a secondary building in the back. It might abut the bike path or it might just be a deeper lot here where commercial presence along the street um, is not essential for to maintain viability. And in fact, adding residential would um, help generate more support for commercial development. So that's what the genesis of this change was, is to allow um, residential units back behind a building in a separate building or in the rear of an existing building where you might have a, um, a certain depth um, facade of commercial so you still get that presence along the sidewalk but you still allow residential in the back. So the thing that pops to mind is a place like Center Court? Um, yes, where you exactly. have It's sort of off prime time around behind other yep. buildings but there's a great number of I mean, they just redid a whole building back there with residential units on the first floor because that's what was there before. Right, they pretty faded. And, yep, it, exactly. And then the other, the other place is 96 Pleasant Street, which yep. you put block rent money into. The front is commercial, but the back is residential. And that, so in other words, that would then permit you, you know, if in one of those situations you wanted to replace a building entirely, you wouldn't have to worry about pre existing, non conforming. Right ground floor level, exactly. you could replace you the entire building board, right? and take advantage of the zero lot line and everything yep. and not have a problem. Yep. Okay. Any uh, questions? Part of it is uh, it's use on property which does not abut a public way. Right. Um, so that's a, a, a street, basically. So sidewalks and streets, you, don't, you want to maintain that commercial viability to create vibrancy so pedestrians walking on the street have interaction in that first floor with retail or, um, you know, office or some other. Um, Can you think of some more other, other places where this may apply? So, so Center Court's a good example of that. Right. right. Well, I heard that one. I'm just um, yeah. We've looked at, we've zoned, I don't know, 15 years ago now, but all properties that face a parking yeah. lot here, we rezoned those central businesses 15 years ago to encourage development. Any of those could work because that's done it in a public way. Which? The, the lots facing um, old uh, or new um, Clark, the Clark Avenue right here. Oh, you know yeah. the backs of the, yeah. the buildings face Old South, but the backs front right. on the bike path well, the now. Right? Okay. So there's, there's not many other examples of any <laughs> of things that would face you know the, the first floor, but behind buildings. So you think about. Um, Sajali's house behind the fire station. Um, he doesn't abut in a public way. His first building he got by saying well, he's having a studio on the first floor, but really that's a single family home and it looks like there's nothing wrong with it. So to me, that's a good place for a house because it's not depriving, it's not killing the street life. And we want more people downtown, but you wouldn't want the same thing on Masonic or Center or anywhere else. So, an interesting phenomenon we're talking about Center Court that isn't a public way now, but if they made if they made I know they they didn't recommend it, but if they turn around and decide to recommend it, well, then the city it's a, council has to approve it. Then it's a public. <laughs> 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 but you know the other examples are if you think about King Street, those deep lots going out, so A to Z, the bank, Waylands, all have really deep lots up to the church. So the front on King Street, you want that commercial mm -hmm. presence, but in the back. It might make sense to do a separate building that's all residential. Any other questions for Number Richard? Okay, how about um, the the next one, the height limits, three fifty and three fifty A. This is to um, um, mod to increase the height limits um, in the general business district, which are currently, which is currently um, 50 feet to um, um, go up to 60 feet. Uh, and this really came out of um, uh, discussions with um, folks developing Atwood Drive. They're doing medical office. The medical office heights need to be um, taller than a standard office building. And they were bumping up against you know, two, three-story building, they were bumping up against the height limits. And so as we look at these other places that aren't central business, where we have um, now 70 feet, I think it was adopted, or it's going through council to go up to 70 feet, um, that um, we're getting a lot more medical office development. If we can encourage um, smaller footprint, but taller, 
we could potentially put those, have, have a smaller footprint, but allow some height in those districts. It went, the other place we have general business is in Florence Center. Well, you know, I don't know that we would go to those heights at this point, but it just allows more flexibility for the different types of office uses that are out there. So any questions from okay. um, I'm going to ask on both of these for any public comment, but it appears that our public is down to Councilor Freeman Daniels. And he's pretty much interested in Henry Street, so I guess we're safe. I, I had my shot at Ed Lou. Oh, at Ed Lou. Okay. <laughs> All right. So just for the record, there there is no request for public comment on either of these. So do we have any any more questions on any of these, or would we uh, entertain a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Okay. Now the public hearing is closed. I just have one non agenda question for Carolyn. Yes. Um, the roof construction at Old School Common, what are they putting on the roof? I figured it was a central business, went through central business. I hope they're they didn't tear the roof off. Yeah, they're putting new slate on. Oh, slate. So oh, faux slate. Okay. Yeah. All right. So back to our. I didn't know what you were going to run off, so I wanted to make sure I could discuss it. No, I'm not. I just want to hear what you're doing. Well, I'll move to. Uh, um, just, just, a, just a question for the, the. You want to do the first, the first three A, B, and C as a group. Yes. You want to do it as a group, and just for. For, for some discussion, um, you know, one of the reasons we had the additional public hearing was, you know, Councilor Freeman Daniels had a big suggestion, and then Councilor Adams had a big suggestion, and then Councilor Freeman Daniels had another suggestion that maybe we just chop off everything above six, and I think that's merit for discussion, but to me it was more a council discussion than an ordinance discussion. I don't know how you feel about that. I don't think, I mean, personally, I don't think I want to just cut the top off of it without it getting to council. I mean, what happens at council is one thing, but I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to take your proposal or the over, I wouldn't want to take it off the table here and not send it back for discussion with full council. I'd rather send it back with Councilor Freeman Daniels, you know, special permit over seven, and you're bringing the subdivision regulation for 10 or more, and then if the council chooses in its infinite wisdom to say, okay, six or nothing, you know, below six or nothing until we get more, more, more specific recommendations. Then that's well, certainly why don't I, I was just going to move these as is to full council and have those I be introduced but, at full council. Move as amended by Councilor Adams is ten or more. Because um, that wasn't. It is, yeah. It's included now, but yeah, okay, we, so yeah, uh, we, but we'd be adding it here, right? The ten or more. The tenor, the tenor. Well, no, that uh, that came at the last council meeting. It was in it was before you in the July meeting, and then, but we did include it in the advertising just to be safe. So, I don't procedurally. I think it was already on there. I don't know. So with, with, with the included amendment. Oh, okay. Right. right. So you would vote to recommend it forward. as amended by that. Right. Yeah. Just so that we it gets back. Yeah. As one complete thing, and we we can do it, but you can't. I don't think you can just throw it in unless we do it. Right. So moved. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. <laughs> just as you said. <laughs> that way moved. That way moved. Second. Second. Okay. Any more discussion on that? Well, Councilor Freeman Daniels, you can propose an amendment if you want to, Council. Okay. Yeah. Because I I mean I think that recommendation had some potential merit to it. I just would not want to preclude a full-fledged debate at council on that one. This, this is just a teaser. There's more to come? <laughs> uh -oh. Carolyn's not going to sleep well again for a couple of days. All right, so all in favor? Of Aye. The, Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, how about the, and that would include the more than one structure? Actually, no. Well, I was just doing the A, A, B, and C. Okay. And then I'll just I'll move the next item, which is the weather one structure ordinance. Uh, forward to the full okay. council with a positive recommendation. Okay. Any more discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. How about uh, the next one, 350C, uh, dimensional regulations in central business? 
That one's come back from Ed Lou, and that's the only other place it went was Ed Lou, right? right. So we, were, we can act on that one because it didn't go anywhere else. I'll also move that with a positive recommendation for the board process. Okay, second. Aye. Aye. And then the height limit in general business. To, uh, also that poll one. Yeah. I'll move for the positive recommendation. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you. Do you want to stay for any more of our fun? Or? Yeah, thank uh, you. Okay. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Yes, yes, Carolyn, does that mean that when I put these before council on Thursday, I'm going to lose these in three? Yeah. Because everything's in front. Is there anything changed on the original fronts? Or just, no. no. No, just that paragraph for this. And there's nothing changed on URA? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And the next one, and, and Councillor Adams is going to lead us through some of these next ones since he's the author of them. Sure. The um, order on. Uh, um, I'm just going to ask since it's 20 to 8. Are we, are we going to be here for another hour or more? Just because we are in the council for a little break, Mr. Brunco. I'm looking, I'm looking at all of these in the back Well, I'm comfortable if you want to take a break. I don't think an hour we should want to just take a break. We'll take a little break, we'll take a little break, we'll take a little break, we'll break it's been, we'll change our, take off our zoning thinking caps. And we're back after a short recess, a little coffee break. So, our next uh, item, item eight, is an order, um, is an order on committee on ordinances, appointments, and rules that Councilor Adams is going to lead us through. Well, I mean, I, I, we, we discussed that last time. Um, the idea was to merge appointments. The idea was to, you know, in the overview was we're trying to maybe hopefully consolidate some of the functions of some of the committees. And appointments seem to do just that one function alone. And uh, I thought and I thought maybe it would make sense if we merge that into this uh, committee. There aren't appointments every month generally. And um, and now we don't do claims anymore, which actually really did take up a, a substantial amount of time. I think this actually take up uh, less time than claims. So I think even if we do take that new function, these meetings might generally be shorter. And I spoke with two members of the, uh, uh, all three members of the Appointments Evaluations Committee currently, and two out of three um, supported it. One had some concerns, but um, I think that is that's a good place for consolidation. Why this particular committee? And I did try to, and I gave her the same the same reasoning um, that I just gave this committee. So um, it's been some time since I've spoken to her, so I'm not sure she's she's had time to mull it over and think about it a little bit. Maybe she shares. No, no, she shares. So she shares. Uh, respect that she also shares okay. it. Um, Another thing we can do too is we can uh, we can not have it take effect until the next term, so only because it didn't come from the committee. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that might be a good idea. Any questions? Who would actually call the potential appointees into the meeting? Because right now it's the chair that would be okay, contact them, tell them that we're going to meet at this time. Yeah. The chair. I mean, I, I imagine the chair at this. The same thing, but the, the, pretty much the same function, but within this committee. Because yeah, I would encourage us, any any changes we reshuffle with committees should be effective with the new council. That way, the new council president gets to readjust who goes where, and and the, and you don't usurp the authority of anybody for the remainder of the term. And so forth. Yeah, it doesn't. Nobody gets their feelings hurt. A lot of them got their agendas planned out for the rest of the year. And we'll just we'll do it. So really the only thing this changes is ultimately doing away with appointments and evaluations. Right. 
functions one committee, yeah. and incorporating that function here. Right. right. Um, the only the only thing that um, I don't know that comes to question that um, expressed this at one point I mean, that they have to be enough committees, committees so enough places to put councils. And so just depending on how many meetings are left. Yeah. I think that at least compared to other cities, we have an outstanding number of committees. There are some cities that have about three to five committees total, bigger cities too. So I think we really do have a lot of committees. And and um, there's actually you know there, there's actually two committees consolidated and one created. So there's only a loss of one committee. Uh, that loss of one committee. So okay. I think really. And which I'm sorry, did I miss which two are consolidated? Well, now, now I propose in this one to consolidate the consolidated culture and rec with um, social services and veterans. So that, that would be the other consolidation. And, and the next thing that we're talking about is not just this, but all committees, right? The next thing on our agenda is a review of recommendations for all the committees. Yeah. So. But, but one more thing, we've got a committee on ordinance appointments and rules, and right now it's rules, orders, and ordinances. Can't, you don't really want to leave out orders or it'll be those things that. Can we deal with orders in this committee? <clears throat> well, the governor in front of you with these, these are orders. These are orders. Yeah, but I mean, I can change it. Maybe. What's the problem with keeping the word order? Nothing. I don't, I don't so we just add. We're just getting rid of elections, right? Wasn't that the only thing that we. Uh, elections and plans. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we could just leave orders and add or appointments. But I like the way <laughs> You like what? OAR. OAR. Or or yeah, so, or well, <laughs> two R's, you can still call it Yeah, I guess we could do this. And just add appointments to it. Yeah. Ordinances, rules, and orders. Or Great. Right now, it's rules, rules, orders, and orders. Ordinances. You might want to switch the order so that it's rules, broken. ordinances, and orders right now. And then you want to add appointments. Yeah. And, okay. I mean, whatever. You so want we've got to come up with a new acronym. Roar. R. R. O. A. There's two O's. Two O's. So, um, I, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll figure out the acronym. Rules, orders, appointments, and ordinances. Ordinance. Giving up claims and giving up elections. So we want to take a little vote on that one. Now you have your list of the <coughs> adopt council committees, and then we go on to talk about. We have several on council committees here. We did that one. Now we have adopt council committees, and we're talking about the cultural recreational that we want to change around and yeah. put culture and rec with veterans. And yeah, since since last. Um, is this the that's the yeah, recommendation? That's, well, that, well, that's that's that's, that's actually reviewed it too because it's in our packet, right? Yeah, this one, this is from the packet. So we're yeah. going to amend this one as well. And then that one as well because I propose to merge culture and recreation with various various other services. stays the same, finance stays the same. Okay. So you're going to add on this committee on rules, orders, appointments, and ordinances. Right. To this one order. To the, to the big list. Right. Are you going to change the years to 2000? 
The council committees are adopted, period, and placed into, or, or comma, and placed into a consolidated document following the council's rules, effective and effective. Uh, because these are now council rules, right, not ordinances. Correct. Right. So they'd all have to just get accepted by the new council, but they'd be ready. Because the new council wants to accept its rules at the first meeting, right? right. So yes. we have this in place, and then we just bring it up to get it accepted. I'm just wondering if we can vote on it. suggestion to get to take care of both these issues and that's <clears throat> to complete it and send it back to council mm -hmm. which would then table it do what it wants to do uh, because you really can't you can't give a, a new set of elected representatives um, their rules right so you have to wait until January and then with the ordinances do the same thing um, the ordinances which of course eliminate all the council rules recommend those but of course, you can't eliminate them to the, the council can eliminate them tomorrow. So again, you could eliminate. You could actually vote. The council could actually vote to eliminate all the council committees in the last meeting of the year, because there will be no more council meetings and no more council committees. So then, the beginning of the year, there exists no council committees. The council has to do the rules. adopt its rules. Well, we can't. The only thing procedurally is that, that makes sense as far as leading the, the ordinances goes. That makes sense. But we can't postpone something to the end of the term. That's tailored to the, the council. But, but the council, the council, the council you would recommend it to the council. The council can postpone it indefinitely. Yeah. So this committee can. But it dies the end. But my point is, it dies the end. But we can carry it forward. We can carry it at that last meeting. We just send it forward to the new council. Right. And particularly oh, yeah. when it comes to okay. with their yeah. rules, that they're going to, you know, every year, even if we don't change them, we readopt the same rules. So if we have the rules in place, you know, the the. the New council president can go. These are the rules that came recommended from last session for our rules this year. Pass them around and say, you know, does the council want to adopt these new these new rules? So I'll just okay. move this. I'll just move this uh, yes. forward to the full council. That was a recommendation. And we finished. Uh, let's make sure we finished it for Mary. So we did. We did um, the new the new version of ordinance. Right. And we're talking about merging culture and rec and veterans and social services. Right. And then, uh, were those the only other one? Was that the only other one? That Just you one more slide. Um, for Enlu, I propose merging um, just a review of uh, community development, uh, community development block grant to, to Enlu, because I think it makes more sense then. And, uh, um, is it in social services then? Uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. So I thought that made sense to take that out. This is a silly thing, but you've changed the order of the title of the Why don't you just keep the same 
Or you want to put community development in there? I mean, we could put community development in there. At the end. I mean, it's a new function, so I think it should be in the title somewhere. Yeah. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't really care where. Now, um, right now, the reason that the CDBG stuff goes to um, social services and veterans is because a lot of that <coughs> CDBG yeah, what do you think? Well, um, because those are social. Development grant funds. Which now. Can be part of this committee. This committee. Which I think, I agree with you. I think that's a more appropriate place for it as an EDLU rather than. Yeah, I'm reviewing that piece. That's going to make more sense to me. Is that what you think? It does make more sense to me to put it in. Well, it has to have been, a, I'm, just, I'm just wondering what kind of um, input you've gotten from the existing committees. Have you spoken to Ed Blue about like, taking on, well, for example, the members of Ed Blue, has like, this been a topic of discussion? Well, but the three of you are not Ed Blue. I'm not. Oh, you're not? I'm not. I used to be, right? I used to be. Okay. So um, the answer is no, we haven't discussed it at, at Ed Blue. Um, but I, I, um, the way I read it, I read it that um, the EDLU could review CDBG funds relating to infrastructure projects and other community development projects, but also it, of course, could still stay with social services and mm -hmm. events affairs, depending on how the mayor wants to. Because remember, the mayor isn't bound to, to mm -hmm. have any council committee review them. So the mayor can go to one of the other. That's how I read it. So, so what and would I, an alternative way be to just keep the committees, um, the names as is, and then, by the prerogative of the mayor, just uh, submit those CDBG things in the, into the committees where they seem more relevant. If they're dealing more with social services, wow. send them there. If they're dealing more but with can I just Can I just finish the last part? Is it, I don't, Edlu typically doesn't have a heavy schedule, so it, it can't accommodate that. And um, the only other part is I just, I think that it makes, I do, I agree, I think it, it's okay to add that community part in because frankly actually it's kind of what Ed Luce, Ed Luce is kind of working on right now like a, the discussion about the uh, benches and so on and, which is not only down you know it's not only community uh, economic development and so on so I think it's okay to add the word because the way I see Ed Lou and I, I'm obviously not the chair I've only been on it for two years the way I see it is as kind of like the council's version of planning and so planning doesn't isn't just economically oriented. So that's that's my well, and, and when it comes to referrals, if it's a block grant thing that's clearly social service related, it could still get referred by council there anyway. They just wouldn't own the title, that's where they all go. So this could still be right. Ed Lowe, yeah. only only really this could still be Ed Lowe because it never really made sense in terms of pronouncing the the acronym. But it could be Etched to me. Um, you get this, you get to put the H after this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it's etched to me. I mean, we could etch to me. Because I can agree with moving that basic function there, you know, with the understanding that if it's clearly a social service thing alone, the council could still send it to social services that yeah. belong there, but they wouldn't own everything because a lot of the stuff is housing, I mean a lot of the block grant stuff is housing related, which makes more sense going over there. So. Right. Yeah. Um, any other? No. Is that, is uh, that pretty much otherwise? Just, to, just the change to this committee, the merger, uh, with the, change, the merger of the appointments of this committee, uh, the merger of culture and recreation and veterans and social services, and uh, moving up, reviewing of uh, Back on your culture, recreation, veterans, and social services, you mentioned Board of Almoners, but I believe that he's still with the Seawall that said that no. and the trust fund will no longer be. That should be. Because they're on the charter, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's, that should be gone. Yeah, if I can move to a minute, yeah, that should be gone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Because uh, that left with the charter, right? That's it. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. should be the charter. Just copy the whole thing, actually. Okay. So that's just a Scrivener's strike. We don't have to vote on that one. 
So the things we do need to vote on is first we should probably vote on number 10, which is the merger of culture, recreation, veterans, and social services. So do I have a motion on that one? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And now that we've amended our two committees, uh, a motion on adopt council committees as amended. What is the echo going to sound like now? <laughs> Etch blue. Etch blue. E C D E C You stick the H after the C. E C D H. It's a lot of vowels in there. E C D H O. You want to be able to pronounce it after the H after the C. And they'll be on new people anyway. And they'll be on new people. They won't be said. I'm on that committee. So, um, uh, on number nine, I got a motion on nine to adopt committees. So, second. Okay. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And do we have eight? We did. We did eight. We did oh, eight. Okay. We voted on eight. We voted on ten, okay. and we voted on nine. Okay. Um, and now we got to amend council committees. Okay. What's that leave again, us? Again, but on the agenda for Thursday, because I have to do all this tomorrow. Um, you're going to want this as a request table, or what are we requesting? Well, we, uh, if you could request table to, can you, do you want to put the date certain on it? It'll be the second, the second the, the last meeting of the year. Request, request these be to last December. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you um, what part of our meeting are you here for, just to make sure it hasn't happened yet? Well, that's what I was coming to check and see. <laughs> you know, we went through the zoning stuff already. Okay, so request to table to December last meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll send them with a positive recommendation and they're going to table. They're not actually going to be three anymore. They're going to be just one, right? Because they're all going into that one order. Uh, the, the council committee reorganization order? Oh, you're, you're going to put it into one? Okay. We can, we can, is that? Isn't that what you wanted? Yeah, but so there's going to be, so the ordinance is getting deleted and that's going to happen the last meeting of December and you're going to merge all those into one? Yes. Yeah. So we do, we do delete the ordinances and vote on the new recommended rules with the understanding the new council's got to adopt them, adopt them themselves once we get there. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay. Now, what, what is your intent with item 11, which is also city council rules? I thought we have we accomplished that too. I think we have. Haven't we? Oh no, that's um, that's a different change. Um, there, uh, anyhow, one of them was um, an error about. Well, this uh, is an ordinance, so twenty-two two. Yeah, that, is that this one? That's that one. But that's the one to eliminate, right? Oh yeah, no, this is to eliminate. That's right. That's okay. to eliminate. Yeah, so yeah, delete. That's right. Yeah. In other words, delete. you're eliminating them as ordinances. They're going to be council That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the, this is the deletion. So we've already yeah. talked about yeah. that one. So okay. So I'll move, to, I'll move we this send one. this with a positive recommendation Second. to the full council. Second. Okay. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So that, <laughs> that takes care of... Uh, number 11. Number that, take, that takes care of number 11. So, and, and we know what we're doing with those at the meeting. Yeah. So a list of enforcing officers. And this is one that we, we want to sponsor. It's actually 12, 13, and 14 are together. 12, 13, and 14. And these are just the enforcing officers for non-criminal disposition police, the city engineer, by, um, and uh, oh, the food oh, the food vendors are, are different. But right, these are actually, actually brought forward by Chief Stinkwood, and it is a timing thing that if they could be literally put on the agenda this Thursday and vote for late file. Okay. No, not late file. Oh, we have time. Yeah, we until tomorrow noon. Oh, yes. Okay. 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 But if these could go on um, Thursday's agenda as being recommended by ordinance. Then they don't have to get sent out. And to reading, then he could enforce them beginning right away. Yeah. Okay. okay. And this is all the, for the non-criminal food, food carts. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Food cart, so. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll move this with a positive recommendation to the full and, council. Um, did we, do we, if we're going to do 14-2, then we may want to look, but 14, they're all, they're all from the mayor, too. They're all together. Do yeah, you have a chance three. to look at the food cart stuff? I have, yeah. All right, have you looked at yeah, the food well, cart Yeah, well, it's, it's not okay. much different than what it was, right? Oh, that was the ice cream. No, that was, no, the, that was the ice cream people. Yeah, I have okay. some questions about this. Food one? Yeah. Do you want to 
want to take care of the other two then? Sure. Then well, why don't we take care of well, the other the other ones are enforcing for this. Oh, then you're yeah, right. Yeah, so we want okay, to do this. So okay. We don't yep. want. We want to have the. Got it. So, what were your concerns about it? Because uh, we don't have we don't have this now, which is why we're hustling to do it. More questions than concerns. I, I like the idea of it, but uh, when I think about where these where these are allowed, this this uh, these sales are allowed. It's uh, not in central business. And actually, could you tell me exactly? I mean, if you happen to know the exact parameters or. or of central business and and Florence general business. Yeah, well, um, general business in Florence is basically Main Street from where the Cooperative Bank is, right? The, you know, right when it turns to Main from Locust, sort of from where the Cooperative Bank is in the bike shop, up through where um, the it doesn't incorporate the Adventist. Church, but it does the nursing home. You know, remember the Florence nursing home that's now a CSO? Yep. All right, that's the end of it that way. Uh -huh. So Main Street to there, and then it goes up Maple Street to um, the factory buildings, where the paint store, where Depot Street is, where the paint store is, and where those factories are there. And then it goes the other way down as far Side as Side Street on that side. So it goes down, I think it goes down to Middle Street on one side and uh, West Center on the other side. Okay. So it, it's relatively compact there. So these are typically the, um, the food carts that come to construction sites. And what the well, food. but like the like the mushroom people are up by Smith or whatever that little group is. And uh, I think the concept behind it was they just don't want them parking in front of a stationary restaurant. Right, but this says that they can That's what I'm curious yeah. about. So so central like business. What are the parameters of that? Central business starts uh, about where the post office is on Bridge Street and goes a little way down Market and Holly. For example, they wouldn't have been able to come to the police station no. for construction. So, I mean, because that's where you usually see these mobile cars well, the, at the construction site. You know, the, they, would they be allowed the, 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 those catering carts that do construction sites, yeah. they they tend to drive onto the site more than they. To the extent possible. Yeah. yeah, but they're um, these are more the ones that park and stay there for six hours. Oh, how would this impact? Okay, so would, would this impact like construction sites where those? For the, sandwich and put it, and well, yeah, for the, the and then they go off to the next site. And they go, they don't stay very long. Right. They come for coffee break and right. they hit the road. Right. Yeah. And uh, um, where, where is it going out to? You were telling me. Oh, it's it, Holland yeah. Market. So it goes a little down Holland Market. It goes down Pleasant Street. Most of the way down Pleasant Street. It goes up King Street. We changed it. It goes up King Street to where the church is. We just changed that to central business, the, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. It goes to there. And then it continues up Main Street, and it ends at, um, I think, St. Mary's Church is in, or part of it's in. Does it include Plasky Park? Um, it includes Plasky Park, and it includes, it goes up a little bit up West Street. I think it includes a parking garage. It doesn't go on the other side of the street, but I think it includes the library and Smith's parking garage. Because what I'm thinking about and is, is, is where is a person really going to realistically sell stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, where's, where can they actually get the traffic to actually? Well, they could do they can do Elm Street by Smith if they want to, because Elm Street by Smith yeah. is not in. Yeah. They can do. They could go up further on King Street. They have to go past the church. They could go past the church on King Street. Yeah, but I mean, I mean I'm just looking at. This. Where would they really go down there, though? Mm -hmm. like, I mean, you know, I mean, if you have a food cart, I mean, you're not, you can't be up the sidewalk. I mean, you can't be on the street. Where are they going to go? We're well, saying that they're not allowed is what the story is saying. They're saying <laughs> I mean, that they're 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 Right. We're saying you're yeah. allowed, except for these areas. And those yeah. areas those are the, the areas. only place they would right. really make money. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I'm I, curious to hear what the reasoning and, is. And I think they want to, um, the reason they're doing it is they... To limit the competition. They just want to... With the existing restaurants down here. They don't want to park in front of the I mean, this is... Almost like, I mean, it's kind of illusory. I mean, thinking that someone can really have 
a successful business doing this, being that they're excluded from the place parts of the city where people are. Right. Okay. Councilor Freeman Daniels. I don't really have a dog in this fight, but I, I do want to um, point out that I think that it's been a sort of a long standing practice of the city not to have blue carts yeah. at all. It, it was actually from DPW, I think it was in their family way. So now that, it, now that that seems to have been challenged and is, has uh, fallen, this is just kind of reinforcing past practice and actually probably a little bit more liberal than it was before. Challenged uh, by right. the Yeah, was it actually challenged or? My, my understanding was that, you know, the, the several of the food cop card operators said specifically, why can't we do this? Right. And they were told, well, there's a DPW ordinance about it, but I think it appeared that the DPW might have had an unwritten or policy or something, but it wasn't. You just couldn't get a permit. Yeah, it, it wasn't any sort of statute or ordinance or anything. And the state licenses these people, you know, so they're saying, well, if the state licenses and you don't have an ordinance saying, where you can be, you know, the, we'll pro, you know, we'll probably see something like this for the dispensaries. Yeah, and if the state license it, there must be a state statute saying that they give you, give you know, allow their No, because they can, I mean. Well, they, they, they can have, they can be licensed with a state office and have this license. So, so it looks like with the, because we have this whole enforcement piece too, yeah. that they got to be able to check them for their yeah. workers' comp and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so help the Board of Health can check them out. And, what I might suggest with this one, if there's no objections, is those are good questions. But if we pass this to council, without yeah, yeah let's, let's, I just, want to hear more. Yeah, you yeah. want to just send it without yeah, a yeah. recommendation, yeah. and then see what the yes. so supreme we'll body wants to do with it. And we'll let the mayor and or whoever it is. You could let the mayor and Chief Singlet. Yeah, comment and advocate. For it. Sure, if, we, if, if, if well, it's I'd possible like to, to request it. a memo. I, I, well, the mayor's probably going to be here, right? Yeah, yeah we'll we can just, so we just have the mayor. Okay. So we'll send it. Um, so you want to move to send it without recommendation? Yes. Simply to allow the mayor to yes. vouch for his ordinance. Right. Okay. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good. And that's for 13, 12, 13, 14. Yes. The enforcement authority and the ordinances. Right. Okay. Um, so now we're up to Bates Street, and is it okay if we just we skip that one? Uh, Councilor from Bake Street, and then the council can send it to TNP, and then they can have their way yeah. with it. Um, so the next one would be. Are we, I'm sorry, are we skipping it? What exactly are we doing that? It's on the agenda, so what, what do we do with this? Can I make that formal request? Yeah. yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, regarding Bate Street, I have to confess. Um, I, even though I'm, I'm put on there as recommending it, I don't recall recommending it, but it, I'm positive it has to do with the no parking on North Street once the North Street project's completed. Uh, my intention is to, because it's most like, it, I would believe that the council would want to refer this to transportation and parking, but because of the, the way the, the council meetings are this month, it either goes to council this month or it goes to transportation and parking this month. So I prefer to put it on the transportation and parking agenda for this month, then bring it to council for September. So you'd like to withdraw this? Yeah, please. Well, we have a really long time for September already. Wait, you but want to withdraw this from here? Well, he, wants yeah. to, he doesn't want to take it, but he, he wants, wants it to be referred. Just, he wants he it just to referred. referred to, to You'll see it again. Parking. You'll see it again. It'll come back from PMP. I right. think he just wants us to refer it to transportation and parking at the council level. We can do that here. Can you proceed to withdraw at this point? No, I, I would just like like the, the, the ordinance mm -hmm. committee not to sponsor it. And then I'll bring it forward. I'll, we, we will skip the council meeting on Thursday. And I'll bring it, I'll put it on the agenda for transportation and parking on Tuesday, on next Tuesday. And then, and then from there, we'll send it on to the council. Okay. We'll refer it back to ordinance. And then we should have it voted on by the mid second meeting in September, right. which is, a little late given the when they're planning on visit, finishing North Street, but I don't think it'll be too late, so I think we should be okay. So, shall we just table the thing? Is that what you want to table it? I don't think we can table it here. Um, we'll for, just for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm mean, for like a month or something. I mean, we can't, we can't table it indefinitely here, but we can table it for a month. Okay. No, it's, it's, it, it, yeah, we have six days to refer it. Yeah, yeah. we can table it for a month. Yeah, and it'll be back here in 60 days, won't it? 
Yeah. Yeah, it'll be back in 60 <laughs> days, but it will be sent to TMT first and then be recommended by them. Okay. That was a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so that one's tabled. So the next one is South Street, and that is the one you want to, because that did go, that went to TMP, but didn't get officially referred to us because the meeting ended early. Regard, regarding number 16, can I, can I, um, I'm sorry. Okay. Regarding number 16, um, this was a, there was a conversation that took place between myself and Council Murphy where I asked him to place this on the agenda. And in the meantime, because it had been discussed for transportation and parking, uh, in the meantime, I had, I had talked with uh, um, Director Huntley about it. And um, Director Huntley believes that we can just uh, scratch out the line on South Street and not may not require an ordinance. So um, uh, I, I I thank um, Council Murphy for putting this on the agenda. But we're just gonna we're just gonna scratch out the lines and see if that works. Um, so so well, it's, we, not, it's, it's not something for, or it's something on the agenda. We honestly we honestly don't need it. I mean we haven't fin I haven't submitted language to the to the committee. Okay. So and, I guess uh, we table this one too. Yeah, please. So second. Uh, second I have a question. Yeah, and, and uh, my uh, I'm sorry. Anything my belief is that anything regarding council rules is that anything for sponsorship at the committee level can be tabled indefinitely. Um, it's only referrals that must report back to the committee. Well, so and the these council. two never really got referred anyway, right? Right. So these weren't referred to us. We just so sort of, okay. yeah, they didn't, because right, right, right. we ran out of meeting and never did. They, well, they weren't even on the meeting. Oh, they weren't even there. Right. Um, okay. okay, so they could just kind of go over their items to talk about. We'll get there. We're going to get there one way or the other. Pretty much. Okay. So now we're on to Bridge Street. Is Tell us if that was, oh, that one good here, if that's one we really... Okay. Is that the school we're, zone? We're back to we're back to actual deliberation here. Uh, <laughs> numbers um, numbers uh, 17, 18, and 19 all were recommended unanimously from the Transportation and Parking Commission, and uh, they were created by the um, the, uh, the Department of Public Works in relation to the uh, new buses that will be coming through Northampton. They're already coming. They're already coming in now. Uh, and they're articulated buses. They have an. They have their, their double. Their, they have two, two, two cars in them, and they have a bend in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, the PBTA, in conjunction with the DPW, is concerned about the parking on Main Street and Bridge Street. Um, there are. There is the need to to slightly change where the bus stops are and to slightly reduce the parking on both streets. So. Um, these were recommended by the DPW, PBTA, and uh, then finally passed at the transportation, recommended by the Transportation Department Commission. So um, if we can have a recommendation from ordinance, then they can be voted on. They're already, they're already coming through the city now. It'll just make it much easier for, the, for them to, to move about the city, uh, and, and uh, can be voted on this Thursday. Okay. So that's... 312, 102, 104. No, 104, 114, and 114. Okay. Oh, that's right, because we did away with sections. So, do I have a recommendation on those? Have you reviewed those? They just uh, enhance or enlarge the bus stops, right? Basically, so it's. That the, Bus we're not losing much parking. I think it might be one space or two. Basically, we're going to move the bus stop next to the church. We're going to actually move it so that it's, it doesn't actually so that it doesn't eliminate as much parking. Uh, but we do have to take a spot away in front of Pulaski Park and uh, I think Bridge Street too. Okay, so they, they can fit in a double right. a longer bus. Okay, move with the funds recommendation. Second. So, Belmont Avenue. Yes, sir. Uh, Belmont Ave is um, 
is really just a constituent service issue. Uh, not even my constituent, but uh, the, the, um, it doesn't eliminate any parking space or anything. All it does is really honestly move a sign. Um, there's a, on the edge of Belmont, Belmont is a, is a curvy street and on its own corner, there's a, there's a, a driveway and people often just don't see the driveway. And they, um, park. and they park in front of it. So the idea is to move the no parking sign, which is on the, if you're looking at the drive, it's on the right side to the left side. Still no parking, the same, it's, you're not eliminating a spot, you're just creating a visual sign where people tend to park. What all in favor? Aye. 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 The, the bridge road section from the roundabout to really to the light, uh, the first light. Um, it didn't used to be a light, it's the blinking light, and now it's a now it's a full traffic light. I can't remember the name of the street, Oak Street or something like that. Um, is a is a concern because it because of the amount of children there and so on and so forth. So the um, the state has changed its. It used to be that you could put a school zone in a middle school. The state has changed its rules so that you actually can put a school zone into a middle school. So, a partial is a partial response to what the residents have wanted, which is some speed control. Where uh, the DPW created this ordinance for, for a school zone, and uh, where uh, where we, it was recommended at TPC, and, and we're hoping that uh, it can be voted on the council quickly. So it's going to go from Jupiter Street to Oak Street. It's going to be. It, it's we're using the maximum allowable by by state guidelines zone before and after before and after the, the school. Zone. Right. Um, this doesn't fund you know signs that blink or anything like that. It just creates the zone. Mm -hmm. We and the, they, the residents understand that we don't have the funds to necessarily. So quick flashing lights. Right. And exactly. Understand. And and it conforms with all with the new state regulations. And once it, but that drops over like what, 25 miles an hour? Yeah, but only during certain portions of the day. Of the day. So right. during the time the kids are running around. Well, yeah, during, during those times, the, it doesn't regard, uh, regarding after school activities, it doesn't cover those sorts of things. It's really during dismissal times and, and, uh, and arrival times. And when they're out. <coughs> so recommendation of this one? Move to send forward with positive recommendation. Second. Okay. In favor? Aye. 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 I won't say much because Councillor Murphy was there. Break, basically, this is an order that was created. That came. This would be a council order that came out of TPC uh, in conformity with uh, Section 312.16, um, just to create pavement markings. That was previously discussed at the council meeting, and um, it was. Uh, it was passed with a majority, but not a not unanimously. Can you just tell us a little bit about the opposition there, or the, what their reasoning was from the chief and the um, I think the uh, again, Councillor Murphy was there too, so he could he could recount it just as easily. I think uh, Director Huntley felt that um, the signs had been installed, that the uh, two-hour parking had effectively eliminated any of the complaints, so why do this when we could just do the two-hour mark? I think he was, he didn't like, he didn't like the, an, an additional step of painting lines onto the street. I, I, if I can speak for him. If I could just add something related to this. I've taken several visits up there now since this whole thing started during different times of the day. I just haven't seen, not, not, I'm, I'm sure it's there, I just haven't seen the, the difficulties that the neighbors have described. The last time I was there, it was just the other day, actually, I had a doctor's appointment there, and it was at, it was at 3 o'clock. That was the last time I was there. Where park? I parked, actually, in the doctor's office. But I, went, I went down middle, I went down middle street and went back through just to look, because they, they had space in the, in the office lot. I just didn't see what they were describing at all, and I had it in any of my trips. So I'm, 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 
slightly confused as to what has happened because none of the times I've been there have I seen you know, any problem. I saw plenty of, of, of uh, the street wasn't taken up by, by any cops. So it's still a little bit of a loss here. The, um, we actually, after the temporary ordinance expired, we kind of wanted the next step to be that they'd mark the street right. to see if that helped. Remember, I was talking yes. about that. Right. Right. And, and DPW basically said, we don't want to mark a residential street. It's a bad precedent. You know, we'll, and, and then they said, well, we'll mark it if the ordinance is in place to support the ordinance, right. but we don't want to do it unless the ordinance is there. And Councilor Freeman Daniels is the one that suggested, well, if we make it an order, then they'll mark it, and you'll be able to do that interim step. And then if it doesn't work, we still have time before the snow flies, which is when it's really bad, is when the street gets narrower, when, when it's, you know, that we still have time to turn the ordinance on again. And the point of the marking, too, was to deal with the complaint that cars are right up next to the driveway. Encroaching on the driveway. Which has confused this issue. Yeah. This is a really yeah. separate thing. Yeah. Right. So if this, if this solves the problem, we pull the signs out. If it, if it doesn't, then we turn the ordinance on, we get the spaces. So it, it takes a little more time, it's a little more considerate. I guess it's the point of understanding what the problem yeah. is. And it, well, the other thing to remember is this doesn't go all the way down the street. It goes like 600 feet down the street because the problem is only at one end. And the people at the other end didn't want it because they said, we don't have a problem. Because it's too far to walk. But we're going to, we're going to, we're going to still mark, we're going to put temporary marking. It only only for that six hundred and thirty okay. something feet, yeah, yeah, not the whole street. Okay. Can I ask um, make a suggestion? We've got on the second whereas there have been a number of residents complaining. Mm -hmm. Do you really want that at a council meeting or would you want to say residents with concerns? That's a good point. Yeah, that's fine. You can have some more actually. Just I'm not complaining. Residents concerned about park vehicles over there. Or inconvenience by, or you know. Are you okay with that, Councilor? Yes. <laughs> They're not mine. Well, it's just that I, I could see the Council President having to read this out loud. And that's that's <laughs> We don't want anybody throwing anything at the Council President. <laughs> <laughs> he has a tough enough job as it is. So instead of complaining, say residents with concerns? With concerns. Yeah. yeah that's, that seems like a reasonable editorial change. <laughs> at this hour. Okay. Um, any more on this one? Motion? So we move to send it with a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Would there be any new business? Or have we had enough business for tonight? Move to adjourn.